Good morning, Vietnam. It's so nice to have this opportunity to be with you. Uh, my name is Guy Baker, and uh, I'm a past president of the Roundtable, 45-year member of Top of the Table, and uh, I've been, I think, a Roundtable member now. I think this is my 52nd year. So it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to visit with you this morning and just talk to you about the secrets that I've learned from the Million Dollar Roundtable about building a successful practice. And I'd have to say, if, if we just crystallize this down to one thing, it's process, understanding process. It's process in prospecting, it's, prospect, it's process in dealing with uh, your clients, with fact finding, with putting proposals together, doing the underwriting and delivering the policy. So that's one massive process, but in each one of those, there are tiny processes that you need to learn. Now, back many years ago, I think it was probably in the 90s, uh, I was asked to do a productivity study and we sent a survey out to all the members of the round table and we got back, I think somewhere around 5,000 responses. And what we learned was that 85% of all the sales came out of a great fact finder. In other words, if you, if you were able to get the client to a fact finder, you had an 85% probability of making that sale. So what should you reasonably concentrate on? Fact finders or uh, closing the sale? See, closing the sale is just kind of happens naturally if you know how to deal with your clients. What you really need to uh, concentrate on is prospecting and finding good people and how to get them into a fact finder. So that's some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Now, uh, what I've found is, is that every fact finder ends in a sale. Uh, now, not everyone, but most of them do. And I think as you become more experienced, that will be true for you. So the function of, a, of being successful in this business is deal flow. And deal flow has three key processes. Deal flow from prospecting, deal flow from proposal generation, and deal flow from implementing the case. And when you implement the case, then that's when the relationship really begins. So let, let's look at how you develop leads. How, how do you find people to talk to? So the first thing to do is to identify your apostles, okay? And your apostles are uh, centers of influence and happy clients. In other words, people who really respect and like what you have done for them. And if you have done a great job for them, then they're gonna wanna tell other people about it. So the question is, what do you do for them that's going to be a great job? And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The second thing, is princes. Uh, these are your bread and butter clients. These are the people that you need to develop in order to be able to create a steady cash flow in your business. And then the final type of prospects in the deal flow are kings. These are your big cases, kings and queens. In other words, the people who will help you uh, hit your goals because you do two, three, five of these a year. At least that's what I found in my business was that my bread and butter carried me through, helped me pay the, the bills, you know, the salaries and, and run the organization. But the real uh, success in the business came from the bigger cases. But I couldn't concentrate just on those. I had to do both. So what you want to do is take an inventory of your cases. You know, what, what is your motivation? What is your passion? And you know, what do you love about the business? You know, can each of you take a minute and write down, for instance, what it is about the business that you really love? Now, I can tell you when I first started in the business, I didn't love the business. Uh, in fact, I tried to find a new job every day. I would go into my office, pick up the want ads, and I would look to see if there was anything I could find that I could do that I would prefer to do than sell insurance. But at the end of a, you know, half an hour of going through that, I realized there was nothing there, closed the paper, and then I got to work. The next day, I would do the same thing. And I did that every day for like two years. 
And then I started doing it maybe twice a week, then once a week, you know, once a month. And now I only do it once a year. And I am kidding. But you have to understand that this is a difficult business. And you really have to have a strong motivation, a love for the business to be successful. So are you a missionary or are you a salesperson? You know, are you trying to get people to do what you want them to do? Or are you out there to really, truly help them? And the results of your business are the results of you loving them and helping them and truly caring about them. A third point would be, what is it that you sell? Do you sell problems or do you sell solutions? I've asked this question from, uh, for audiences all over the world. Uh, Jakarta, Singapore, India, you know, uh, Vietnam, I've been to Vietnam, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Europe. And the answer is almost always the same from the audience. They say we sell solutions, but we're gonna look at that and see if that's really true. So the fourth thing is, do you understand your client's needs? In other words, once you really truly understand what it is that they need to do, then you can help them uh, achieve those objectives. And when you help people do what they want to do, when they want to do it, then they'll become apostles for you. So let's look at the process of deal flow. Okay. Find your story. What's your story? Uh, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? And share that with people. Psychologists have shown that people care a lot more about why you care for them and why you're doing what you're doing than what you do and how you do it. So start your interviews with your story, why you are sitting in front of them and why you're in this business. You know, why do you do what you do? What is your process? What's your deliverable? These are things that you need to communicate in that opening interview. And, and these must be defined before you prospect. So where do prospects come from? Well, they can come from letters. You know, you can send out mail. You can do seminars. I've done both of those. Uh, you can make phone calls. When I first got into the business, uh, I had a tape recorder in my car and I would practice my phone uh, conversation. You know, hi, my name is Guy Baker. I'm with Pacific Life. And I would go through that until I did it in a way that I was very comfortable and it sounded no natural and it sounded like something I would want to hear on the other end. Uh, you know, you can go to clients, you know, you've all already have clients, I'm guessing. So you can go back to them and talk to them about who they know and, ha and get referrals from them, right? Uh, which, and you can also do cold calls. I used to, when I would call on somebody, I would look at to the left and the right on businesses or in groups, and I would find people that I could talk to, and I would tell them about what we do. So out of those uh, sources then come the vital few, and these are the ones you're going to be able to work on. They're the ones that are going to turn into opening interviews, and a good opening interview is what leads to a fact finder. Okay, so let's look at the two secrets of prospecting. One is having a good profile. In other words, you need to know who you're looking for. If you don't have a good profile, then it's likely you'll talk to anybody. And if you'll talk to anybody, you may be wasting a lot of time. The second secret of prospecting is going to seem strange maybe, but it's a daily goal. You, know, you need to have something that keeps you on track, that keeps you prospecting on a regular basis. When you stop prospecting, your business stops. It's that simple. When you stop prospecting, your business stops. So you want to have a daily goal. So look at your last 20 sales, the last 20 sales that you've made, and look for the common denominators. What were the commonalities? What were their ages, for instance? Uh, what were their needs? What was the reason that they bought from you? What was their family like? What was their occupation? You know, how did you meet them? If you do a little bit of an analysis of who you've been successful with, that can help you tell who you're likely to be successful with in the future. And so have a profile of the people that you like working with, what the commonalities are relative to their needs, and how you got into an engagement with them in the first place. So 
the second thing I said was, uh, you know, do you like them? You know, most of all, do you like them? And do they like you? Because if they like you and you like them, the chances are very good you're going to do business with them. So the second process secret was setting goals, right? So I think we all need to have a yearly goal. And MDRT is a great one, isn't it? Because you want to come to the meeting and you want to meet other people who have been successful and are doing exactly what you're doing. And one of the things you'll find, which is very unique, is that it's the same all over the world. The people in Indonesia sell business exactly the way they do in Singapore, exactly the way they do in India, in Thailand, in Japan, Korea, all over the world. Uh, this is what we discovered. So have a yearly goal and write it down and keep track of your results. The second thing is have a monthly goal. And a, a good monthly goal would be 10 sales a month. And when I first got in the business, I made between 120 and 150 sales in a year. And the only way I did that was staying the course, having a goal and looking at my monthly goal and keeping good records. The third thing is, is to have a weekly goal. Your goal is two sales a week. Now you might not hit it every week, but some weeks you might have three or four and other weeks you might only have one. Some weeks you might get shut out. But if you keep track of it and you see what your averages are, you need to average two sales a week if you wanna make the million dollar round table. The fourth thing is a daily goal. And my daily goal came out of my experience in high school playing football. It was, I know that doesn't make any sense, but it will in a minute. When, when I played football, we, it was very hot where I lived. So we practiced early in the morning and then we practiced late in the afternoon after the sun had gone down and they called these two a days. And so I just adopted that to prospecting. I wanted to find two people every day that would talk to me about life insurance. Now notice what I said, talk to me about life insurance. In other words, they didn't uh, agree to have a cup of coffee with me or a Coke. They didn't agree to have lunch with me. They didn't agree to just get together and talk. They agreed to get together to talk to me about life insurance. And so when you find two people every day that will agree to, to review their insurance program with you, then you're in a situation where you have a reasonable chance to talk to them about getting a fact finder. And so that's the secret to prospecting. Two people every day. Now you could do one a day, you could do three a day, but I, I set it at two because that was a reasonable goal and it, it's not the easiest thing to hit. But that was my goal every day. So two people every day who will talk to you about life insurance. Now, what we have to understand is there's a selling process and there's seven steps to the selling process. First one is finding somebody to talk to. The second one is opening up the case, then developing the relationship, and then designing whatever you're gonna show them and helping them determine what it is that they really want to do. So that might be an iteration, a loop. Then the next one is they decide what they're going to do. And then finally you deliver. A lot of D's in there, weren't there? But that's the process. Prospecting, opening, fact finder. That's where you want to concentrate most of your effort because the rest of it will all come naturally. But you want to prospect, open a case, and then develop that case. So. What a sales process needs then is to start with a prospect, right? So we've got to have our prospect. Then we have to hold an opening interview. And that opening interview is where you determine two things. One is, do you want to work with them? So you have to find out enough information in that interview to find out whether or not they fit your profile and whether there's somebody that you can do business with. The second thing, is, is that they have to decide if they want to work with you because there's two decisions. And if they don't want to work with you, you don't want to keep wasting your time. So we, we have to hold that opening interview and hold it in a way that gets us to where we want to be. The next thing is, is that once you hold the opening interview, now you go to the fact finder. Now, sometimes the fact finder can be in that opening interview. But generally speaking, what I have found is that if you wait to do the fact finder in a second interview, it gives you an opportunity to build rapport with them and to make sure 
that they're committed to talking to you. The next one is you've got to decide whether or not there's a problem and, and help them understand the depth of that problem. And then we can talk about the solution. And all of that then culminates in a recommendation. In other words, you can sit down with them and help them understand what you think they should do given all the facts that they've given you. And then finally, they're ready to take action. Now, this may seem strange. And like I said, I've, I've sold well over a billion dollars worth of life insurance. And my closing interview, my closing question is always the same. So if you're ready for that, let me tell you what it is. It's where would you like to go from here? That's my closing interview. It's not, do you want to take, you know, do you want to take a physical? Can I get an application? Do you want to start the process? It's where do you want to go from here? Because the, they will tell you what they think and whether or not they agree that your solutions really solve their problems. Because remember, you don't have a case until you have a problem. So let's look at the buyer's process. You know, we, we just looked at the seller's process, but the buyer has a process. And what the buyer does is they go through four steps, but it all starts in the same place. And that's equilibrium. In other words, they've got all the problems they need for all the solutions they've got. And so we've got this equilibrium between the solutions and the problems. What we need to do then is disrupt that equilibrium. And we disrupt that equilibrium by asking questions. And the better you are at asking questions, the better able you are to disrupt the equilibrium. So let's look at what we sell. You know, do we sell problems or do we sell solutions? And like I told you, most of the audiences I've ever talked to when I've asked that question and they do a raise of hands, they say we sell solutions. And that's absolutely true. We do sell solutions. But look what happens if we concentrate on the solutions too early. What happens is that uh, the, the client is going to concentrate on the cost and they're going to measure the cost versus the solution. And the heavier the cost is, the lighter the solution becomes. And so over a period of time, we end up being almost in an adversarial uh, position with them because we're trying to convince them that the cost is worth the solution. And that really is not a good place to be. You don't want to be in an adversarial relationship with a client. You want to be their partner, their consultant, their advisor. You want to help come alongside them to help them figure out what it is they really want to do. So what if we focus on problems? Well, another word for problems is pain. And the greater the pain, the lighter the solution. I mean, think about this. Uh, you have a toothache. And it's really driving you crazy. And you go to the dentist and he says it's going to cost $250 or whatever the denomination is uh, in, in Vietnam. Okay. And you look at that and you say, I can't afford that. But the pain's so great. What happens? You're willing to pay anything to get rid of that pain. And so that's what we have to do. We have to become pain merchants and we have to help them understand the pain of their problem. And the better able you are to explain the pain of the problem, the better able you are to be able to help them come to a determination as to what's the best thing. So you want to be referable. You want your apostles to be able to say, hey, uh, Guy is a really good uh, advisor. He's somebody that you can trust. He's somebody that you can sit down with and you can disclose your situation and he'll give you a fair evaluation. So that's what you want clients to say about you, apostles and centers of influence. So you must become known by the problems you solve, not the solutions you sell. <clears throat> you don't want to be known as a life insurance agent necessarily, but you want to be known as somebody who helps families stay together if somebody dies somebody that helps transition business ownership from one generation to the, to the next, somebody that helps with tax planning and investment planning. You see, what happens is that people will buy what they want to buy when they want to buy it. In other words, we cannot make people do anything they don't want to do. And so 
to try and learn phrases and words that are going to manipulate people into doing something just is not going to work. What we have to do is be honest, forthright, have integrity, deal with in, in a transparent manner and help them understand exactly what it is that they need to do based on the pain of the fact finder, not on the solutions that you wanna sell. So a real quick summary here, build a profile, figure out who your best prospects are, who you're looking for, because if you do that properly, what will happen is you will reject some people, but you also won't waste time on them. And you will only focus on people who are in the right age bracket, right income bracket, right net worth bracket, you know, that they have the needs that you are addressing. The second thing is to establish a goal. And that goal, as I said, should be MDRT at the top level, but at the bottom level, every day, it should be two people every day that you find that will agree to talk to you about life insurance or long-term care or uh, you know, catastrophic insurance, whatever products that you're focusing on. Another important thing is to know what it is you are selling and why, okay? Uh, become an expert, product expert. Understand all of the contractual provisions and be able to just talk about this naturally. Because remember, people do what they want to do when they want to do it. So I hope this time together has been helpful to you. I hope I've given you some good ideas that will give you uh, access to the market that will get you on track to be able to qualify for the million dollar round table. Now, one of the things that I learned many, many years ago uh, through practice was how to open up a, an interview. And what I learned was when I studied people is that they were so busy being successful that they didn't really have time to pay attention to the things that I thought were important for them to look at. And if you think about it, what is the one objection most people will give you besides they can't afford it? I'm just too busy to look at. I can't do it right now. I'm just too busy. So the rule of objections is very simple. Whoever says the objection first owns it. So if you let them say the objection first, then they're going to own it and use it against you. But if you say it first, then it's not as powerful and they can't make it work for them the same way as if they owned it first. So let me give you an example. I'm too busy, right? So if I say to you, look, one of the things we have discovered in working with people like you is that, and successful people is that they're so busy being successful, they don't have time to pay attention to the changes that take place and how they will impact their family. Now, on the other hand, what happens is if they say, well, no, no, I don't want to talk to you guys right now. I'm just too busy. What do I do with that? But if I've already said that they're too busy, I can then say to them, you're absolutely right, Jack. That's, that's what we've learned is that people like you are too busy. But what happens is you end up with a plan by default instead of design. And so what we do is we help people plan, have a plan by design, not default. And we help them figure out what the price tag is of that plan, okay? And with that price tag, we can help them figure out what's the best way to solve their problems. So if you're interested, let's sit down. Let's spend, you know, half an hour together. Let's talk and see if there's a way for us to be able to work together. Anyway, that, I've used that basic story for 50 years. And it has worked for me fabulously over that time frame. So again, I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, I look forward to our question and answer time. Uh, please you know, be sure to process uh, what I've been sharing with you because these are secrets that you will learn at MDRT and you will hear that this is a commonality among all of the members. Almost every member has learned to be a partner instead of a salesperson, has learned to uh, come alongside their clients rather than try and get them to do something that they don't necessarily want to do. Because remember, people do what they want to do when they want to do it. So 
Thank you very much. I look forward to visiting with you.